we got to move forward to collect. We that, that, wait, wait that's I'm, a lot. unpack those numbers for me again. One percent of sure. So twenty percent of uncollected revenue. Oh, okay. Gotcha. So the Auditor General's report in 2017 said 20% is uncollected. If 1% of that is collected, that's $400 million. Welcome to our part two episode of the Decoding Cross-Border E-Commerce podcast and talking about CARM. In the first uh, part, which is another episode, it really was, uh, um, that may end up just becoming the Idiot's Guide to CARM for e-commerce uh, merchants. And we had the privilege of uh, uh, interviewing Al Dewar and Mac West. We're not going to go through full introductions right now, but with GHY brokers, uh, I'll just say they know a lot about the subject. They, they know a whole lot more than you or I, Aaron. Um, so in this segment two, we're going to focus on really the CARM deep dive, but this has really now we're talking to mostly customs brokers and uh, carriers, anyone in the industry that uh, is really trying to understand what do they what do they have to worry about with CARM? So yeah, yeah, because I in that in that first episode talking strictly to e-commerce merchants, we we discovered it's not going to be very disruptive for e-commerce merchants out of the gate on come May. Right. Um, it may never be, if you're just selling B2C, it may never even be disruptive for you at all. Yeah. You may not have to do a thing um, unless you become a Canadian business, yep. et cetera, et cetera. Um, but really the dis disruption sounds like it's happening on that supply chain side with the, the brokers and carriers that are actually clearing I, I, the I think that's where we hear most of the uh, the noise, right? Oh, yeah. It's, and, uh... and well, and I think sometimes their noise and, and some of their panic and unrest, they end up, they end up pushing some of that burden onto e-commerce merchants yeah. and creating a lot of uh, a lot of heartache oh. and confusion, um, which is unnecessary, I think, in, in many of the cases. But I think if we deep dive into this now and what their world's like and what they're seeing, it, it might make a little more sense, which I'm yeah. super excited about this podcast. Well, well this is fun. I, I want to hear the history, though, of CARM, like how in the world this came about. Mac, could you, could you start off just giving us that history, the rollout of CARM, um, the origin story, set, set, set the stage for us. How do we get here, Mac? Sure. It's, it's a great question. And I, I, I think our friends South and in America set the table for CARM with ACE, um, seeing a system like ACE and, you know, looking around the world and really there's only three other countries that have invested this type of money into a system, the U S the UK, Australia, now, now Canada, this, this origin story starts back. I think the dates, a lot of different people say different timelines as to when the first, you know, CARM acronym was thrown around, but definitely in 2010 was catching on traction. You, you hear it all the way back into the 90s of the thinking and theory of what it could become. But the problem that Canada Customs is trying to solve is the collection of duty and taxes, the accounting of it, the back end process to, you know, the financial system. ARM will create more transparency. It's a, it will be a better system for customs to have a pulse on Canadian trade. And um, that's ultimately the problem they're trying to solve. To get further into that origin story, you know, you see in 2017, a pivotal moment from the Auditor General, essentially blasting Canada customs saying, look, at there is 20% of collected duty and taxes at minimum going, you know, uncollected. So you're looking at a huge amount of financial opportunity for the Canadian government. Um, also, hopefully increase compliance to processes that lead to, to duty and tax collection, because I think there's classification challenges. And, you know, I'm maybe pe preaching to the choir with you guys on this, uh, but it there's there's challenges within the Canadian process. But this system is hopefully going to solve some of that. Um, when we like, I think when we look at what the opportunity is to get this on the table within the House of Commons, the Canadian government and, and push it forward, it is what could be collected and how much more visibility could exist for importers um, in accessing their own data instead of being reliant on third parties. But I think there's work there to be done. Um, I don't know, Al, if you have anything to add to that origin story. Well, the government wanted a direct connection with where the accountability lied or lies, and that being the importer of record. 
So all too often, the connection has been with uh, brokers or couriers or those third-party service providers, yet the accountability lies with who the importer of record is. And uh, I think every importer of record, in my opinion, every importer of record uses more than one broker or service provider. Like people that are using the UPS and the FedEx, particularly if you're using them for air shipments, uh, where brokerage is often included in the cost of their, their package deal, uh, people are saying, well, if you're doing it for free, sure, just go ahead. Now, whether or not the processing of it uh, in that fashion mirrors how you would do it or a, or another service provider or customs broker would do it, there, there's inconsistencies that could exist within there, but the importer is responsible for those inconsistencies. So what you heard Mac make reference to, there's going to be a central ledger. That central ledger makes you as an importer fully accountable, and the government wanted to make sure that they had that direct connection to each business through a business account manager or business account managers that were overseeing the profile of tax collection, as well as, uh, quite frankly, the, as he alluded to, the accuracy. So so it sounds like, I mean, this started, and in, in, in now that I've heard the origin story here from you guys, really to hold to account the responsible party for the import, which is the importer of record. And in order to do that, they needed a system to track it. Wow. I wish I could have say, why can't I speak with that few words and say that? Perfect, Flint. Outstanding. Well, it's a few notes I took. Okay. Uh, so then why is everybody freaking out? That's a good question. Because that's what I... <clears throat> and, and, I don't use that word uh, um, lightly. Uh, it's it's uh, pretty descriptive. <laughs> it's pretty well, I, like I mentioned in the, the last podcast, I mean, if I look at um, the U.S. side, ace is a three-letter word, but carm is a four-letter word, it feels like. So what, why? <laughs> okay, but so for 100 years, I've been using UPS for something, and I've been using GHY for something else. And they both send me bills. I pay both sets of bills. Like, I'm happy with that. Now you're telling me that I'm any payment of bill is going to go against my oldest debt. I'm having difficulty holding this service provider accountable and that service provider accountable. I'm, I'm going to have to somehow aggregate the information that they provide to me for release and compliance to marry that up into a portal to see how... I'm doing with trade compliance and reporting. That that's not my job. I'm in I'm in purchasing. Mm. I'm in sales. What the heck? I'm freaking out because people are saying that there's more things that are going to hit me. They're not telling me about a transition plan of of grace where nobody's going to hold me to account for a year. And but I if I'm in those roles that has been in supply chain or procurement or anything that's I'm hearing a whole new wave of uh, accountability that I've never experienced before. And I don't want it. So you have a lot of new things to deal with and actually a lot of unknowns and unknowns can cause a lot of uncertainty. <clears throat> so is it is it accurate to say uh, that historically uh Everything is really being managed by the individual broker. So if I've, if I've got goods coming into me, UPS is doing their thing. FedEx is doing their thing. GHY is helping with me clear a number of my other shipments. Um, and they're all independent. And now as an importer, I'm setting up a centralized portal for all of my shipments. And then I have to delegate to each one of them authority to manage my shipments on my behalf. Is that is that right? That's perfect. Okay. And how does this how does this complicate things? Um, so I mean, for me, I guess it gives me some visibility and also some accountability. Mm -hmm. um, how does that impact the the broker world, though? How does it impact the broker world? I, I guess we think of ourselves as being a a service provider in a compliant type of environment. So you and and we want more of your business, right? Because we want to upsell that compliance. This uh, particular water bottle, it's it's metal, but Max may be plastic, uh, Clint's may be ceramic. Uh, if I'm 
in the business of selling water bottles, you, you want to make sure you're classifying the tariff correctly because the government's going to be auditing you know, in that fashion. Um, I'm saying if you're u- using multiple parties, there's there's going to be inconsistencies because some people are going to dive a little bit deeper and some people are just going to interpret things differently. Like even in Canada and the United States, we interpret the same product, even if it's exactly the same, with different tariff classifications. So um, there, there's going to be challenges within uh, customs brokerage as it relates to compliance and trade facilitation. Yeah, well, because classification, like we had an episode on this, and I think what was said is it's a bit more of an art than a science. <laughs> and uh, uh, so I definitely can see how that can can create some challenges here where that you need to have accountability. Well, let, let, you know, <laughs> I'm really grateful at the particular this particular. My wife is away this week, so I think the house is clean. But she comes back next week, and her her idea of clean is entirely different than my idea of clean. <laughs> Fair. Uh, speaking speaking, I, think of, I can relate to that. Speaking of clean, dirty laundry, right? Mm. We're, we well, want to jump into. Do you have any more I, questions? I, I think so. We... Uh, well, I, I think I've got a question that that will lead directly into this, which is. Okay, this concept sounds good for some of the parties involved. Uh, it seems like it could be simplified if you put everything on the uh, in, in one centralized system. But is everything running on schedule on on this rollout of CARM? And if not, why is it not? Like, what if, if it's such a great idea? Why is it taking so long to to roll out? This is the sixth version of CARM. Is what I heard last week at Whoa. the. Uh... The House of Commons. So I have to use two um, hands to count that high. That's that's pretty good. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. Fortunately, we're done with the design. At some point, we need to be done with the design, right? You can't look at design forever. So it's it's into its implementation phase, and I think there is no turning back at this point. We need, you know, the the big bang or the quiet big bang or whatever is to come on May thirteenth, um, the go live date. But it has been pushed quite a bit, and I think some of it rightly so. Um, but last week, I think to further expand on where industry's at, trade, trade chain partners, you know, seeing UPS and FedEx, their, test, their, their, their testimonies in correlation with, um, you know, Canadian Society of Customs Brokers and Import-Export Canada. And uh, the big one that stands out to me is the Canadian Federation of Independent Businesses and, you know, their take on small and medium enterprises and and how I guess ill prepared they are and not registered. So, um, it, like, we've seen delays, yes, multiple delays. I don't think we're ever going to get to a point where everybody is feeling like, yeah, we need to go, and this is a a comfortable light switch to flip. But that's the reality of where we're at. Um, the highlights last week: industry saying we're not ready. Um, you, you're hearing that essentially every testimony is saying, you know, we're not ready. We're, we're not ready, whether it's system readiness, whether it's registration readiness, whether it's contingency planning. There was a lot of focus on that. Um, then you can go down the rabbit hole of the actual IT build and who was all involved with that and the subscription model that was agreed to and how that was being discussed. So there's like a million different ways we could go with this discussion. But yeah, it's been delayed a lot. And I think we're probably at a place where we, we need to move forward. So, so Mac, if I'm understanding right, we've gone through six versions of CARM to get to this point, but now the hesitation is uh, some of the industries dragging their heels because the adoption and the, and the readiness is is not quite there yet. For uh, but the the design of the the legislation, the system is, is pretty well done, but it's just a matter of hey, the the readiness of the industry for it. is is that accurate for the the current state? I, you know, I'd say the design is a little bit off in certain ways. Like what you would hear, and, and you did hear in the case of UPS and FedEx, they both said it should be optional to have to use or access the portal. Uh, UPS stood out when they were asked at that particular testimony. They said, how many people did they have uh, based on their business model registered and delegated on the portal? Like, and this, again, should have been in place two years ago. That's when they said it was going to launch. 
10%. So it's something that's been worked on for, as Mac alluded to, multiple years and you go back goes back to even 2010. So that's 14 years. And you've got a major behemoth in supply chain saying, hi, we've only got 10% of our uh, clients registered and delegated. And you heard Mac say as well, the Canadian Federation of Independent Business saying, we're confused by this. That, that Why can we not just have options as to how we interact with the government? We, we don't want to run from accountability, but please give us options. So some would say uh, to, to challenge you, Aaron, that the... Um, the design is is perhaps flawed. It may it maybe fits a a perfect compliance trade regular regulator uh, perspective, but that's not the real world. So so does that when you say optional? I mean, doesn't I'm, I'm looking at it now from CBSA's perspective and from Canada, which is the whole point of it not being optional is to simplify it for them, correct? And so isn't that, that, that they're saying, hey, make it optional. Mm-hmm. Which is like turning them and say, okay, run two different systems, though, on the other end, right? For for Canada, would that be correct? Well, like, oh, oh, just it... optional for having to access the portal. Like, So we're one of few that have a very high ratio of clients that are registered and delegated in the portal. But what we don't know in, in the case of GHY, because we've been doing it for three years, what we don't know is how many of the people that wound up being business account managers or account holders, they might not even be working at that company anymore. So that's going to be a whole other valley. Like, like delivering mail, I'm sorry, that those people move. They might have moved a few times. And the, the government has tried to, within uh, this portal, create something that they're overseeing and connecting to who responsible parties are that relate to your business. And I, I don't know any business, particularly since COVID, that hasn't went through various transformations when it comes to people. It's not static. It's not part of a regular business flow. That's not saying we're not accountable, but but don't make government speak part of business. Let business decide how to run their business with accountability. So I'll, I'll punctuate that a little bit with some t- t- statistics from, well, really just using the 80-20 rule, right? Because we are very proud of, you know, looking out for the best intentions of our, our clients and, and through navigating CARM and, and getting the amounts registered we have. Like that's that's a big win and, and very important for our clients. But if you look at industry as a whole, use the 80-20 rule, 20% of importers make up 80% of the volume. Those 20% are registered. So I'm at the International Compliance Professionals Association conference in San Diego last week, two weeks ago. And we sit and we're meeting with people talking CARM and, and what the future is. Everybody's registered. They're uh, working for a company who's employed a, a customs program. So, of course, they're probably registered. That would go for that 20% rule. That audience is registered. They know what's coming. The 80% that aren't registered that make up the 20% of the volume fall into the Canadian Federation of Independent Businesses, the small and medium enterprises who are not registered. Um, the UPS volume that we're hearing about at the in the testimonies at, at uh, the House of Commons on the CARM committee, you're, you're seeing the confusion of what exists. And t- what Al's saying is the option should exist like ACE where, you know, is it going to happen? But if we look at what came out of those meetings, um, the CARM committee, meetings, the, the government and, and well, first government and CBSA and then government and industry was essentially, you know, there needs to be some grace around this big bang, grace with reference to surety, grace with reference to registration and an amendment to the bond amount. And I think we can unpack those three different pieces. Well, I called it bond. It should be called security, but uh, you know, the generalized term being, you know, the bond or or cash. So I think really unpacking those three things of what is going to happen into the future helps us understand, you know, what will happen on May 13th, but there's a lot of people not registered. So it's going to so, have to change. So when you say, uh, um, 
optional. Let's say for all the SMBs, the small, medium-sized businesses, this is the 80% of companies that are only making up 20% of the sales. Mm-hmm. Um, w- would you say the some of the industry is pushing for, hey, just leave that status quo and let them, let, let them operate as they are today and, and roll out the portal and let the, the high volume shippers get registered on the portal. Um, is that, is that kind of the push that we're talking about for, uh, uh, making it optional? Absolutely. That was perfect. I'll, I'll tee this up and pass it over for you to you to, to punctuate and get more technical on, but essentially the use of a broker BN for 12 months was the answer to that. But, um, more specifically, Al, it's, that was my segue to you. Sorry. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, no. What, what Aaron said is 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 a hundred percent right. You you've got brokers and you've got express carriers that have said, nail the eighty percent, good job. The twenty percent, let us let trade carriers, carriers, brokers, let them support that based on what is an acceptable risk matrix. That, that that makes, I mean, that mindset makes a lot of sense. Uh, we've seen that with a number of other similar but different topics when it comes to uh, low value tax laws and things in, in, in different countries where they put, a, they put a threshold that says, hey, if you're a big seller, we're going to put it on you to have to, you know, collect and remit sales tax to say mm-hmm. Australia. On this, it's the inverse where it's, hey, if you're, if you're a Canadian business bringing goods into the country and you're small, we're going to let, we're going to, we're going to keep the process simple for you and keep it status quo. But if you're big, Hey, we've got a, we've got a portal that you can um, use to, to, to bring your goods in. And there, there's probably some advantages and things that, that uh, would make sense for them. Um, but the small guy, we're saying the portal's still there if they want it. Yep. Yep. They just don't have to have it because here's, what's going to wind up happening as trade brokers, couriers, as, as they start, They've released things. There's, the border is going to be fluid. It's still going to flow through. Then now you got this transition aspect. There's 200,000 importers in Canada. 60,000 are registered. So, so 140,000 are not registered. So people like Mac and I, we're going to be picking up the phone and we're going to be calling these Canadian Federation of Independent Business. We're going to be taking them away from business, the business they're trying to do. And we're going to be saying, you got to register. And they're going to say, why? For 100 years, we've dealt with you. For 20 years, for 10 years, everything's moved. A lot. Why, why do I have to stop what I'm doing and, and try to register, try to figure out what, what my address was or what my last remittance or tax filing was? Why do I have to do that? Can I not just keep on with my business? And we have to say, sorry, no, the government doesn't doesn't want things like that. The government wants everybody fitting into their box, that box that Mac alluded to that trade compliance professionals live in. It touches on an interesting piece that comes to the facilitation of duties and tax as well. And the initial architecture of CARM saying, you know, importers should deal directly and pay directly. Um, There were some oversights in that framework I mean, an, a non-resident importer or someone based outside of Canada may not have direct banking capabilities with the Canadian government, for example. Like that wasn't a consideration. Like if you're dealing with a, a local regional bank who's not electronically capable to send money, then there's a there's a challenge to that. So there's use cases that exist within the structure for it to happen. There's also the ease of use. Um, the analogy I like to use, and it may not ring true outside of Canada, is the rolling in of your taxes into your mortgage. That's a service. It's it's a provided service. It ensures that you've always paid your taxes. It gives you a monthly, you know, statement. You're paying your mortgage and your tax bit by bit. It's due, I think, two times a year. Um, your taxes, that is, and and you can take that responsibility and pay it direct to your local region, municipality, whatever town. Um, there's a service there and it's the ease of mind. It's the, you know, complete cost. It's one invoice. You're, you're, you're dealing with it. The same thing rings true with duties and tax. So that small importer might not want to manage two payments each month. Um, and the big payments really the one that they do need help auditing and understanding 
with reference to duties and tax. So I think the portal. So Mac, I just, I just want to make sure I understand. Um, if, if I'm a Canadian business, I register for CARM and I delegate authority to GHY. Am I still making my, a separate payment to you for my brokerage services and I have to still facilitate the, the CARM payments or will you facilitate everything for me? I, help me understand what that looks like when I delegate authority. We're, we're all about options and, and positioning the options to say what makes sense to you. The initial construct of CARM was, yes, you would be making two payments and everything needed to be paid direct. Um, that has since been changed. I don't know, Al, if it's changed for good or if it's a temporary change, but my opinion is that it will be you know, status quo and you can pay your broker who will remit on your behalf. Um, it's an important piece of business to keep a pulse on, but there should be an option. There has to be an option there. Government will take money from anybody, but the design was, as you alluded to, uh, Aaron, the design was that they they wanted the direct accountability with the person who was responsible for taxes. And that's not the broker. That's the importer. Okay. But it sounds like they've, they've since uh, opened up to what the importer wants, which is uh, many of the importers, which is the you know, simplified process of, hey, I'm going to, uh, I just want to pay GHY for everything and let them handle it all. Uh, yeah, I think they can, they've conceded to the point to say, hey, we just want the money. We don't care where the money comes from. Mm-hmm. Okay. Makes sense. That does make sense. Makes a lot of sense. <laughs> I I, I want to understand the, the the business numbers that are used and historically and also how if that impacts brokers with CARM. So historically, if there is not a non-resident importer account number with a business number going into Canada, um, it's getting cleared. And let, I, what business number is being used then to clear the package? Is that the broker's business number typically? No. Typically, a broker would never use their business number um, unless it was for a casual shipment. Uh, yes. Mm. Okay. Right. And and a casual shipment is defined as something going to somebody other than a business. Okay. Yeah. Not not for resale, right? Yeah. So yep. This is that's fair. They could, fair. Yeah. Uh, okay. So let's talk about those casual shipments then, because that's the one I was actually kind of thinking about with e-commerce. In that case, you guys might use your business number. Is that accurate? Absolutely. So if, if we were shipping something to you or somebody was shipping something to you, Clint, and you you decided to move up to the Great White North here, uh, what would wind up happening is the government would say to you, we, we don't have the mechanism to give Clint a business number. And it's not a business. They shouldn't have a business number. But yet Clint wants to import something. So there's a special number that every customs broker has that allows them to facilitate trade on behalf of casual shipments and charge and assess tax accordingly. Is, is that going to change over time here? Are you going to be able to continue to use that special number in perpetuity um, uh, with with uh, what's happening here with CARM with, for, for casual imports? Absolutely. And I, I, I would have to guess when you say perpetuity means forever, but yeah. Certainly, I, I see a runway of at least five to ten years. So, so then why 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 is there this push then from these um, from the industry, maybe it's express carriers, for the companies inside the United States to got get a non resident importer account, like well, when these are mostly just casual shipments from yeah, e commerce companies? Like I'm not get I'm still uh, this is not connecting for I, me. Th- that's the part I don't get too because um, as we've kind of unpacked this. Uh, in in our previous podcast and, and and a little bit in this one too, it's status quo for B two C e commerce merchants that that have the consumer in Canada yeah. as the importer of record, which is the large majority of them. Yet those those retailers are getting a lot of pressure from some of these carriers, some of these express carriers, to get an NRI because it seems like there's a lot of panic and and anxiety with these express carriers around CARM, but I I haven't wrapped my head around why. Yeah. Well, it really comes down to the definition as to whether or not those businesses that you're making reference to 
are they carrying on business in Canada? If if they're not, based on, and we covered this in our earlier podcast, based on about 15 different parameters, if there's not, as uh, Clint alluded to, there's no change. So- if they are carrying on business in Canada, based on that rather convoluted description, then they, they should register. So, so is this, I mean, is, is what's happening here that the, the express carriers, and I'm going to kind of, I'm just glue, group them together, right? That they're, um, because they don't know if the companies inside the United States are carrying on business in Canada, they're just making this assumption that maybe they qualify and so therefore get an NRI. Because if I was the express carriers, what I would be then telling my sales force or anyone else that's inside the company that's talking to merchants inside the United States is, look, if you are not carrying on business in Canada, don't worry, we got this. And then on the back end, we know we can use our special, you know, business number essentially. Uh, so, but that is not, that's not what we're hearing out there. It's, it's, so is there anything we're missing out that like, what are we missing? Why, why, why does it seem like they're caring or Mac, right? Why does it seem like they they care so much about, it almost feels like they don't want to use a special business number. Like that's how it almost feels like. <clears throat> can, can I throw like, out another this, theory? This feels to me, and, and I like how you did that Clint with the, the hand motion, carry on. This feels to me like a, a new podcast. Let's, yeah. uh, let's get some of those. <laughs> how uh, many can we spin off? Carriers you're making Part reference three. to. <laughs> and and we can call this uh, carrying on, carrying on, carrying on with trade. Uh, register yeah. or not register? Well, here, Why here, and how? Yeah. Here, here's another speculation I have. Um, it sounds to me, and I'm just going to take some breadcrumbs here and try to put it together, see so if we can make a loaf. Um, Al, it sounds like there is a lot of concern around the readiness, which readiness it sounds like is only a minority are actually registered for CARM, right? So if I put myself in and shoot holes in this, in this theory, but if I, if I put myself in the, in the shoes of these carriers, uh, they're seeing a lot of transactions going into Canada and a lot of them going to SMBs in Canada. So I've got, how many did you say it was? 140,000 that aren't registered, Right. And then you compare that to the number of shippers that are working with in the U.S. And no matter what for them to clear a package, they have to delegate, have somebody delegate authority to them. So they can either have 140,000 and work with them to delegate authority. But if I just get every shipper to get an NRI, I only have to work with them. So again, it still boils down to the, B, the B2B side of it, right, that they're worried about, yeah. right? Yeah. They're worried about that small portion of... B2B, knowing that on the back end in Canada, this is your theory, right? Mm-hmm. That maybe the Canadian big, hey, they're not registering there. Um, this is going to cause a problem because somebody, this is a commercial shipment. Um, and that's... Yeah, and then how, yeah. They, someone got the bright idea. It's like, well, we got a lot fewer shippers to yeah, work with. Yeah. If we can just push them to get an NRI, then we kind of just, we, we negate the the SMB uh, problem in, in with the Canadian businesses, and we don't have to worry about the 140,000 as much. Okay. What, what do they think about it? I don't know. I want to hear what, your theory here. I mean, what do you think of Aaron's theory? Aaron, what you just said is very logical, and that makes sense. And then there's one other thing that I forgot to uh, point out or make reference to that would, uh, and certainly will will drive service providers or customs brokers to try to have more of that registration happening is the government has uh, they've passed uh, they've passed a law but the law hasn't been enacted yet they're saying they will enact the law likely in 2025 and maybe early 2025 where the custom broker and the importer will be jointly and severally liable if you clear something on your business number so if I'm uh, an express carrier or if I'm, if I'm GHY and I'm processing thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of shipments on my business number, and if you find some of those or a, a grouping of those aren't 100% accurate, the government's going to be looking to have that type of or that higher level of accountability once they enact this law. So this law has been passed. So it's, it's on the books, but it hasn't been enacted yet. 
So that, that may be in addition to what you said, Aaron, that may be a driver to say just from a overall risk management standpoint, not just simplicity, but for an overall risk management standpoint, let, let's see if we can't get more people to fit in this non-resident it's a two for one special. basket. It's a two-for-one special, right? Um, if, if they're worried about liability, because today, if you do a casual clearance on your business number, you're not jointly liable. Is that accurate? That's exactly right. Um, so even though they continue can continue to use the special business number into Canada, the liability is increasing if you use it. But if they get everyone to get an NRI, right. then yeah. that future, whatever's on the horizon, like, hey, that's a win there, but also... We we, we have less it's simpler. liability. And, and then today, it's simpler for... There, there's fewer people to... Or fewer companies to worry about getting registered for CARM if we work with all the, all the sellers. All speculative, but... It, well, it makes sense. And, and I think, you know, if we're going to put a little tinfoil hat on what people might be thinking, like, just look at the marketing strategy. So if, if, if we have hundreds, thousands of importers that aren't registered and you look at big couriers, they probably all have accounts across them or could have accounts across them. Like, how do you untangle all of those importers and all of their import processes, whether they're non-resident or, or casual or whatever, it's easier to blanket market to them all like karma's coming register. Mm, um, yeah. There could be, there could be a little bit of that or a lot. I don't know. That makes a lot of sense. It, it, it has been interesting um, in the industry though. Like not everybody's having the same message, but, but there's, there's a few that are in lockstep with this kind of, um, you know, chicken little approach of everybody's got to get registered. Um, everybody should get an NRI. And then there's a number, especially the ones that are heavily focused on B2C e-commerce. They're like, ah, this is a nothing burger. Nothing to worry about. Mm -hmm. It's been really interesting to watch the the very vast differences in, a, in, a, in approach. So you can't even use the internet as a resource and, and the internet's never correct, but I like to use it as inspiration or, you know, using chat GPT to organize my thoughts. Like the, the, the information that comes out of there, you, you need to filter and understand. You actually need to just have be the input, but you can't research Karma online because there's conflicting information around every corner. And um, if you're, reading some of the communications coming from partners, it's even more confusing. So you're exactly right. Like, where do you look for the, the right information? I'm super fortunate that I, I just call Al, say, <laughs> Hey Al, what's, what's the answer here? I don't know. What, what is Al, what is the, uh, what do you think is the biggest misnomer or misinformation out there with Carm right now that, that, uh, um, uh, that, that frustrates you the most? You have to only pick it, one. It, 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 it's probably what Aaron alluded to earlier. It, it's it's not going to impact border fluidity. So sadly, um, well, the government and, and we, we're trying to position registration and support. Uh, what's going to wind up happening come, you know, whether it be the 26th of this month or, or May 13th, it's going to be a nothing burger. So we who uh, took up the challenge of Chicken Little to work, particularly with business, not casual, but particularly with business. We've, we've been talking about it for three years, and trade's not going to see any disruption. And you, you might hear or read that there should be, or, or the low uptake based on the number of uh, people who aren't registered. And, and so it, the border will be fluid. And in certain cases, industry will come off as as being chicken little. And then, and then, if we could make you king for a day, and you could change one thing about Ooh, carm, that's good. what would you change? Well, I got to go with two. Mm. And, or can I, I'll, 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 I'll do two. You can that. answer one for Clint, and I'll ask the same question right after. You can, so you can <laughs> no, give number two. one is registration has to be optional. Let let importers decide if they if they register or in the portal or not, like they'll be accountable. But number two, and uh, this maybe isn't as prevalent in, in the e-com space, but in, in the B2B space, Canada, we've got a goods and services tax. And uh, that goods and service tax, it's, it's an input tax credit. And yet the government is forcing Canadians or will be forcing 
Canadian Canadian business to post security for something that's an input tax credit. And quite frankly, into Canada, we're uh, sorry, guys, we're a kinder, gentler nation here. Uh, like eighty percent of products coming into Canada are, are duty free in their own right. So why are you forcing people to post security? for an input tax credit, the the GST. So th- those are my two. Yeah. So if you're selling domestically, the GST, what do you remit quarterly? If you're a business in Canada, if you're just shipping domestically, selling oh, domestically? Even monthly. Like yeah. it depends on yeah. how 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 big your business is. It, and then, then they're totally changing it and saying now monthly, you- Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. And then, then now they're changing it and saying, except for when it's an import, now you have to pay up front um, uh, more than just up front. You have to have a security in place. You have to post totally different process. Yeah. yeah, yeah, makes sense. I don't know. I mean, I, I guess we can both anoint him king, and uh, maybe these two things could happen. But those those seem. Uh, um, what What else is there? Anything else that we've missed in either our first segment part talking about Carm for e commerce or in the Carm deep dive uh, that we forgot to ask that you wish we you know we we should have hit on. Can we go back and can I answer Aaron's question on, you know, the one thing that stands out to me, I can't remember verbatim what that question was, but not the wish list, you know, not the king for a day, but um, like the one, the one thing that, that I sit back and look at and Al and I talked a little bit this offline and, and I don't know that we're completely aligned, but for security, I'm very proud to have communicated to our network and our clients to say, hey, hold off on a bond. And I think there was a lot of confusion around that. And I think we were acting in the interest of our clients and trying to figure out, as Al alluded to, what is the play or what is going to happen with input tax credits or really a flow through tax that the final consumer or business is left with? Um, Because it doesn't make sense to be securing against that. And um, it doesn't make sense for a quick hit on a bond when there's too much confusion around it and seeing extended grace periods on it. I think we're, um, we're proud of where we are in the positioning and communication around bonds and where we stand in in the lobbying efforts or, or who we stand behind in the lobbying efforts. I think that's been a very challenging space. Um, it's, it's going to happen. And yes, we, we are in a position to offer bonds to our clients and we will be offering bonds to our clients and we're looking for that commitment. Um, but let's figure out what we're bonding against because seeing that the timelines pushed is, is a challenge. But I think, you know, our stance has been, it should be very well received by importers because we're, we're looking out for the interests and actively lobbying for them. Um, and the only other thing, Al, that I would add to the king for a day wish list, there's probably a future where the use case for the broker business number as the importer makes sense. And let me paint this in what would be seen maybe in many times as a, a, a casual import, but it falls into the B2B space and that's hand carry goods that cross the border. So um, like one of our teams internally, our, our Breeze team handles the infrequent importers and new importers. And you'll see a, a farmer in rural Manitoba or the Midwest drive his owned semi truck down to the States to pick up a tractor, a used tractor from another farmer in North Dakota comes back to the border. And essentially that turns into a hand carried goods situation where he is a business and is a farm, but has no idea what's happening with this transaction from a customs component has maybe called us, probably called us and talked about what it's going to cost, but maybe there's a a USMCA or a duty free component to that, but there becomes, okay, I'm now at the border and I'm not registered. This is future state, right? what they're going to get out and go in and, and register and, and get through that process. Like maybe there was an import transaction in that in the past. So like hearing customs, Canada customs talk about, Hey, we're doing pilot projects at the borders, helping people register as it happens. Like it just doesn't seem like it's a viable solution to really not the use case that we're trying to solve in a lot of cases. So the use of the broker BN around that could help. I was getting antsy because I probably said something wrong, so I'll pass it <laughs> well, over to him. I just want, I want to touch on one thing, though, before before you jump in, Al. So is, is the concept that uh, farmers coming through with this tractor and they hand them an iPad and say, I hope you get the address right and you have everything you need for two-factor authentication? Or like, what <laughs> is there something different? Is there something I'm missing here? That's it. <laughs> All right, so do they have a hotel there to put them up for the night when, when we can't get through everything? <laughs> 
yeah, yeah. It just doesn't make sense for for all. So, and the last comment that Clint made, like what what wasn't said or punctuated, I think it really relates to any payment that you do provide to a third party, whether it be a, a broker, whether it be a courier that goes against your account, that goes against your oldest debt. And that uh, courier or broker doesn't have full visibility to all of your debt. And I, I know personally, I just went through this where, and I, I'm I'm still in uh, going to be in marital strife as a result. I, I got a credit card that my wife didn't have full visibility to, yet my wife is the one who is accountable or I've made her accountable and she issues all the payments, but she didn't have full visibility to everything that I spent. And as a result, didn't fully pay for the credit card because she didn't have visibility. And then all of a sudden we started getting these late accounting penalties. And, and I think importers are going to be plagued with that as this program rolls out, because if people don't have that full transparency, yet they're accountable, it, it becomes very awkward. It creates liability. It creates discomfort. It, it creates a poor accountability. And, and that, But that's how the program is designed. Any payment goes against the oldest debt. So importers really need to look at what's on their statement because it's them that's accountable. Mm. Interesting. Well, okay. No, that was, a, that was a great point. Look. We, I, I've got one question yes. to, to wrap this up. May 13th is the deadline, the, the date that is rolling out, right? But this is this has been delayed a number of times before. How are we feeling about our, our, our dates moving forward? Do you, do you see foresee any any delays in the upcoming dates? Tinfoil hat time. I'll, uh, I'll start with a story. So at the International Compliance Professionals Association, our booth, we did a vote. Um, collect business to card cards, give away a prize. Uh, our vote was, you know, is it going to happen or, or be delayed? 76% of educated, I'll say educated importers who, while there was a lot of discussion around what is CARM, um, a lot registered, you know, these are compliance professionals who know CARM, 76% said delayed. All right. That's uh, how. Well, what, what did you, what did you uh, vote in that? Me? Yes. Me, I, I, you, I, Mac. I'm, I'm I'm camp. This has to happen. I think <laughs> um, there's we we need to move forward. Yes, I think it will happen on May 13th, and that's the first time that I have not. You know, we've had joking internal bets on this. This is the first time I've been camp. Yes, it's going May 13th. Mm. The government doesn't get any more money to make it a better program unless this version goes live. So the government is fully committed to making it go live. Do do they have enough? Uh, do they have enough of a push? I I'm agreeing with Mac. I'm. It's there. There will be pain. There will be confusion. But the border will be fluid. That so this is the director of CBSA Ted Gallivan's statement from uh, the meetings a couple of weeks ago. If one percent of the twenty percent is correct, that's an additional four hundred million dollars a year. So we got to move forward to collect. We uh, uh, wait. wait that's uh, a lot. Uh, unpack those numbers for me again. One percent of sure. So twenty percent of uncollected revenue. Oh, okay. Gotcha. So the Auditor General's report in twenty seventeen said twenty percent uncollected. If one percent of that is collected, that's four hundred million. And I think that's Jeez. a pitch to <laughs> say. Well, I think hey, Mr. Gallivan misinterpreted uh, and tried to to use. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mac. He tried to pitch something. Yeah, I, I think everybody's guilty of, you know, exaggerating, but don't let exaggeration get in the way of a good story, I think is what <laughs> people say. So it, it all rings true, right? They, they, we, you know, Canada needs this to move forward. I think it is conceptually a good thing. There's, there's kinks and folds to iron out. Well, thank you both for helping us unpack Carm for e-commerce and in this segment, especially that deep dive and unpacking CARM for the industry, customs brokers, uh, and look forward to hopefully getting you uh, back on another podcast. It's been fun. How about Car CARM post Big Bang? <laughs> <laughs> that sounds good. This has been awesome, guys. I, I appreciate your time on this. Yep. Thank you.